Thank you very much. Thank you very much. There's nothing like a big build-up, is it? So I'm gonna, that was the big build-up. And he's done, because he said there's no fires tonight, that's two of my tricks that I can't do. <laughs> so I, I, don't, I don't normally do tricks, but I might, if you're very good to me, at the end of tonight, do a trick for you. Um, it's one that I practice with my grandchildren, and, and they say, even we can't say how it's done, Grampy, so it must, be, it must be quite good. My grandchildren love this library. They all live away, but whenever they come over and stay in Cardiff, the first thing they say is, can we go to the White Library and see Sue? So Sue is, Sue is the reason I'm here, and I, that she's inflicted me upon you for, for the next hour. I'm going to talk to you about Tommy Cooper. So Tommy Cooper, renowned, of course, for wearing a fez. So I will wear the fez just to start with because in my research, this is the first time I've ever spoken in a library. And there is something, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> that when you put the fez on, your shoulders just start doing that and <coughs> your throat goes a little bit deeper like that. And when I rang Sue, <coughs> I said, Sue, <coughs> is that the local library? She said, depends where you're phoning from. So, <coughs> <laughs> and it is strange, isn't it? Because if you stand in the middle of a library and you go, <coughs> she says, everybody looks at you like you've done. So, but if you do it on an aeroplane, everybody joins in. <laughs> in fact, I came here today a bit earlier on. I was looking at those books there. And there's a fantastic book there about the man who invented crosswords. I can't remember his name. It's P blank blank T blank S. But I'm sure you'll know it. And there was a final one now. That, that there's a fabulous book that Sue's got. You'll all want to see it. It's about the man who got or in fact did a, a glue factory. And in fact, it was so good, I couldn't put it down. Ha ha ha. Anyway, <laughs> as you can see, I don't do a very good impression of Tommy Cooper, but I might do a trick like that on. If you keep smiling and laughing, okay? I might need an assistant as well. Have you are you any good at tricks? That's the one I want then. That's good, okay. <laughs> so Tommy Cooper, I'm gonna to talk to you in really three phases. I'm gonna to talk to you about his life, um, about his legacy, and about the Tommy Cooper Society and what we've done. And hopefully, all my electronic equipment will work. First thing, I'm going to ask you a question. What's the similarity between Tommy Cooper, Sid James, and Moliere? <coughs> and look at all your face going, they're all dead. Exactly, sir. And how did they die? They all died on stage. In fact, that's right. I didn't know Sid James had died on stage. Somebody told me that one last week. And every, every time I go and do this presentation, I've done it about 60 times now, somebody gives me a new bit of information or a bit of a fact. So that's one for you to take home. Moliere, Sid James, because <laughs> you never think of Moliere and Sid James <laughs> together with Tommy Cooper. So, Tommy Cooper, there we are. A son of Caffilly. He was born in Caffilly, uh, as, as I'm sure you all know, because you'll all have been to see the statue. But the interesting thing was, look, he died in 1984. That's 31 years ago, ladies and gentlemen. 31. So you haven't had a new Tommy Cooper joke for 31 years. And in fact, not many of them were new when Tommy told them. So there weren't many new ones then. But as I said, it, it is an awfully long time. And the other thing that this, this slide proves is that not all the books that you look at in the library are the same thickness, which is why it's slanting to one side. <laughs> I did try my best to get them all up the right side, but there we are. You'll have to, you're, you're all going to, I can see you all, all doing that, just a little bit to the side. There we are, my fault, sorry about that. So, how do we know Tommy was a Welshman? And we look there and say, on March the 19th, 1921, he was born in 19 Floynon Street in Caffilly. That's a copy of his birth certificate. His dad was Thomas Cooper. His mum was C Catherine Cooper. His dad uh, had been married before. Sadly, he lost his first wife in childbirth and remarried Catherine. Catherine came from Exeter. Uh, Thomas Cooper came from Pontypridd. He was one of 16 children. And uh, so, as Tommy, uh, Tommy says, and Tommy's family always say, their whole household at Christmas time was filled. You can imagine having 16 brothers and sisters and their families. So it was always a very noisy household. In fact, one of uh, Thomas Cooper's uh, brothers was actually uh, on, in the music hall as a comedian. So perhaps Tommy got some idea of uh, entertainment from that. Um, as I said, he was born in 19th Flinnon Street. He was a very sickly child. Even though he was a very big guy towards the end, he was taller than me and he weighed more than me. He had size 14 shoes. He was a big, big bloke. But when he was born, very sickly, and you can see there's Mrs. Shattuck was present at the birth. In fact, Mrs. Shattuck owned 19th Loynon Street. 
Mr and Mrs Cooper were not in good straits. It was a two up, two down house. They rented one of the rooms and Mrs Shattuck was uh, there at, at the birth. And in fact, she is reported to have said, because Tommy was so sickly to Mrs Cooper, just a little word, she said, what I suggest you do is put a little bit, a nip of brandy in with his milk. And possibly that's where things started going wrong for Tommy, because he, he did like a little nip with many things after that. And 99 Floynon Street, you'll see that. But you will remember, everybody, ladies and gentlemen, that he was born on, in 1921. And that's quite important, as you can see there, that 1921, because we have found in our research for this presentation that some of the slides and some of the people think he was born in 1922, but we'll come to that in a minute. There is the little cherub, and you can almost see, can't you, that <laughs> if I were to put that on top of him there, you've got the, the makings of a, of a young Tommy Cooper. Uh, and that's, that's was him. <coughs> they lived in, in, in Caerphilly until Tommy was about three years old. Um, and here's 19 Cloynon Street. It's, it's down there. It's near. They built, just built a new station on the Rumney line, Enneglin and Churchill Park, and that's at the bottom of this road. And we were hoping that they would actually put a little thing saying, Home of Tommy Cooper. And they said they would do that if they had enough money left over. And uh, that was four years ago, and they still haven't got around to doing it, which is a bit annoying, but there we are. And you can see this picture's taken in the middle of a, a wonderful Caerphilly summer. Uh, the, the sun beating down there. And outside is a plaque, and on the plaque, uh, th th this couple here, this is a gentleman who does Tommy Cooper impressions, and this is Vicky Cooper, this is Tommy's daughter. He had one daughter and one son. The son was called Thomas Cooper Jr. And you can see the plaque there, and as, I, as you all know, he was born in 1921, which is why we smile when we see this plaque, because as you see, the plaque says, celebrates his birth in March 22. Vicky's reportedly said when, when she unveiled the plaque, oh, my dad would have loved that. Why is that? Well, she said he would have, he'd have to wait an extra year to get his pension. And Tommy was very careful with money. Um, there's, there's a great story that whenever he was out somewhere, you know, getting a taxi home, he, the taxi driver would say, oh, hello, Mr. Cooper, yeah, have a good show tonight? Yes, fine. And they'd get to wherever they were. They'd say, well, the fare's five pounds, Mr. Cooper. So he'd give him five pounds. And Tommy would lean over to the taxi driver, and they'd always have a jacket on, and he'd just push something in the top of the taxi driver's jacket pocket. And he'd say, when you get home, son, have a drink on me. And of course, they get home, and the taxi driver, no doubt, would see his wife and say, Hi, Tommy Cooper, in the, uh, the, the taxi. And he said, Have a drink of me. Look at this. And he'd pull out, hoping it was a five pound note. It was, in fact, a tea bag. <laughs> Regularly known for that. And he had quite a number of pencils, which we found, which said, Stolen from Tommy Cooper. He wasn't mean, but he was very careful with money. Um, and here we have, we find another, uh, when he moved to Exeter, we find another date, 1922. So, <laughs> once there seems to be some law that once once a plaque goes wrong, uh, it, it won't get the right date. But Tommy was not well, and Caerphilly, as you can imagine, in the 1920s was a very industrial town. It had the coke ovens at one end, it had the coal mines, and it was not good for Thomas's bronchitis. And so they decided to move back to where uh, his mum came from, from Catherine came from, and they went back to Exeter. And when they were in Exeter, here they are in Exeter. This is outside Tommy's on the lovely tricycle. You don't see many of those around nowadays, do you, uh, in Toys R Us? But uh, here they are, Mr. and Mrs. Cooper. And I was giving a presentation one day and somebody said, do you know what that badge signifies? And I didn't. Does anyone here know what that signifies? That was his honourable discharge badge. So you can imagine, he, he was actually gassed in the war. And so he was actually, obviously, uh, told to leave the forces because he wasn't fit enough to do it. Went back, went back to being a coal miner, <laughs> which is... <laughs> I don't know which you'd prefer to do anyway, he was back there. But if you'd been seen walking around Caerphilly in 1918 and you didn't have an honourable discharge badge, someone would give you the, the white feather for, uh, for cowardice, obviously. Sorry, I, I pulled the plugs out, haven't I? Which one does it go in? That one? Yep, yeah, that's it. So, uh, yeah, so that was, that was the, uh, the honourable discharge. So they, so they went back to, to live in, um, uh, in Exeter. They lived in a place very much, if you can imagine Sophia Gardens in the old days is where all the circuses came and all the shows were and the fun fairs, etc. And their house was very near to that. And here's the house that they, were, uh, that they bought. And what they did to earn a living in those days, because obviously there was no coal mining in Exeter, was they actually bought an ice cream machine. And Mrs. Cooper used to make ice cream. And whenever the fates or the fairs or the circuses were there, they'd wheel it up into the field and they would go and sell ice cream. And there's a great story one day, because very nearby was Exeter Racecourse. And Mr. Cooper, 
Um, there's a wonderful word which my, my gran always used to use, he's a bit of a ne'er-do-well. Well, Mr. Cooper was a ne'er-do-well. And if there was a racing course nearby and there were horses running, then that's where the money went from the family. And if they did well, they had a great time. If they didn't do well, well, it was up to Mrs. Cooper to keep things going. So one day she was on her own with Tommy, walks up to the field, there's a circus there, and said, what am I going to do? I've got him for eight hours. What am I going to do with, with Tommy? And the chap said, I'll look after him, madam. Give him to me. Anyway, she went away. But an hour later, came back, and she said, oh, where's Tommy? He said, he's having a whale of a time. He's got three new friends. They looked around the corner, and in a cage, there were three monkeys and Tommy having, having their tea together. <laughs> so, possibly Tommy got some of his jokes from them. <coughs> or possibly they laughed at some of them, we know. Um, he had a brother in... Uh, 1932 called David. David sadly is no longer with us but David actually opened a uh, joke shop um, and a magician shop in Eastbourne still run by his daughter Sabrina Cooper and uh, they, they carry on there. There's Tommy as you can see that's Tommy on that side he's beginning to look like the Tommy Cooper that we all, all remember. Around about this time when he was about 11 his aunt Lucy gave him and all of us I'm sure everyone in, in this room has had the famous magician set how to become a magician and Tommy had it as well and he did all the tricks and he's purported that his dad said to him Tommy one day you'll grow up and one day you may be a magician and as Tommy always said ha, 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 I never did either so he, <laughs> but but he did practice the tricks and he did get very involved with doing some tricks and he wanted, liked to do them in the local church hall and he'd come to a, like a night out tonight and he would try you know, the, with the tricks that were, the, uh, were in, in the local village hall and fortunately, the first time he ever did it, all the tricks went wrong. <laughs> Which is sort of quite interesting that later on that's what he made his act. But they went wrong and people were laughing rather than applauding. And because they were laughing, Tommy got very upset and left the stage. But we think that, you know, at that time, ingrained there was so the, 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 the idea for an act of a magician where things didn't go right. He was not a great academic, uh, and he, he never professed to be, so he left school at 15. He joined the British Powerboat uh, Company. And now they had moved from Exeter by this time, and they'd moved to the New Forest. Uh, and they were very near to Fawley, near to the refinery there. And Hythe was where the, uh, the, um, uh, the British Powerboat Company were. He was an apprentice. He was apprenticed for seven years. Uh, at 10 shillings a week he got for 48 hours uh, as an apprentice and within the first week when he was 16 now he was actually sent home from work because he was stayed behind in the canteen showing all his mates some of the tricks that he'd actually got to work out so he, he became a, he was a disruptive element right from the beginning and in fact he only lasts there for two years he left there uh, after two years and he joined up now the British power boat um, company was going to make motor torpedo boats which for the coming war was very uh, very important but Tommy decided he, he would sign up so in 1939 he signed up and he became he signed up with the horse guards and became Trooper Cooper and uh, uh, so at the age of 19 and I say the next time you hear on Radio 2 you hear Super Trooper you'll all be humming along to Super Trooper and he'll say Trooper Cooper which is which is what he was he started off as a, as a, a trooper and he ended up as a sergeant he was an excellent boxer he got trained in older shot um, but uh, and he, in fact they say he could have become a professional boxer because as I said he was a very big guy but he used to joke and say that he had uh, adverts for the local butcher um, put on the soles of his feet so that when he was knocked over he could actually get some money for displaying the advertisements um, he was the life and soul of the, of, of the naffy. He did enjoy a drink, as I've perhaps alluded to before, and there's a famous occasion when he was on duty and it was snowing and it was a very cold night like tonight, and he got the midnight to 2am 2, 2 shift and he was outside Horse Guard Parade with his Busby on and, and he was uh, there. And before he'd gone out, of course, he'd had... Have I pulled that out again? No, uh, 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 he, he'd actually had a couple of whiskies just to keep the inner man obviously uh, nice and warm. So of course he's standing outside in the rain and there's nothing happening so he's bored stiff and he fell asleep. But to his horror he then heard his, his, uh, uh, ser his sergeant major, uh, regimental sergeant major coming around the corner with a company officer and they'd been to some sort of do and they were coming back very late and Tommy of course is asleep. Oops, I don't know what's happening there. So and if you're asleep on duty uh, it's uh, well, as cashiering offence, you are uh, put up on, uh, on in, 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 uh, in front of the court. 
uh, and for a court martial. So Tommy is now asleep and thinking, what can I do? Well, he's just, he's woken up obviously, but he's looking as if he's asleep. So just as they came and stood in front of him going, Kuba, he said, sorry, uh, 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 amen. Yes, sir. Sorry, sir. I'll just say my prayers before we open. <laughs> and got away with it. Phew. And I suppose that's the way he got away with things a lot throughout his life. Um, he was posted to North Africa. Uh, well, wait, let's just go there. Here he is, uh, this is about the age of 17 or 18, uh, and he was posted to, set to, to, to uh, North Africa. And when he was in North Africa, he was out on, uh, with the, the horse guards, he was out on a patrol, and he actually, uh, um, a bomb blew up, he got a bit of shrapnel on his arm, and he was actually sent to Alexandria for a bit of rest and recuperation. There he was, went along, and part of the rest and re recuperation was ENSA, the, uh, the, 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 the forces, I suppose show uh, team that, that put on shows, uh, you've seen them on it, eight half hot man. Somebody told me that ENSA stands for every night something awful. Um, and Tommy, Tommy actually did started doing his act. And in fact, it was when he was starting to do that act that the Fez became born. I'll tell you that in a minute. Here he is as a, as a, a trooper, Cooper, um, over in, uh, in North Africa. And how did that happen? Well, one night, Tommy's timekeeping was never very good, and he used to come on stage with a pith helmet. In fact, he was dressed like, um, with the, the, you know, remember Morecambe Wise, or Morecambe, Eric Morecambe used to have those big shorts that were wired out. Well, he, he'd have exactly the same, and he'd come on with a pith helmet, and he'd take the first 10 minutes doing stories and jokes about the pith helmet. Turned up one night, ran onto stage, no pith helmet. Ooh, what am I gonna do? To his luck, around the corner comes a, one of the waiters with a Jalalabab on, and, wearing that. So, I can't, I can't do it with the hair. So anyway, he, uh, as he went past, Tommy just said, give us the hat, son. Put the hat on. And the rest, as they say, is history. You won't find anybody who doesn't regard that as the symbol of Tommy Cooper. And in fact, Frank Carson once told a story that when he was doing um, some of the tour ships, when you get off at Alexandria, he said, there's the, the market, the souk in front of you. And the first table, he said, was a guy who just had Fezzes all over the table. Well, all the people had gone, so Frank got off and he said, hey, son, what, what, I'll, have, I'll have one of those, please. So he put it on, and as soon as he put it on, the guy, the little Egyptian guy in the other one went, ha, 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 just like that, just like that. <laughs> so, of course, Frank did exactly the same, ha, 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 just like that, just like that. And he realised after about five minutes, this, guy, this Egyptian guy couldn't say anything else, but he got so used to people getting off the boat, English people, put them, putting the hat on and going, ha, 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 just like that, no, not like that, just like that. Uh, that's all he could say, and that's all, he, that's all he found out to say. But as Frank said, international um, uh, sign of Tommy Cooper. He'd been there about uh, three months. He was obviously getting better, but they decided to keep him in ENSA rather than send him out as a liability on the road. And he needed a lady to play his uh, accompanist uh, for when he came on and they'd play the Sheikh of Arabi on the piano and they'd give him some incidental music. So that lady came out and her name was Gwen, Gwen Henty. And this is Gwen Henty here. And they'd been together, well, it, she came out and after three months together uh, in the war in Egypt, they decided to get married. And this is a picture of them on their honeymoon in Cyprus. Not bad, is it, in 1944, if you can have your honeymoon in Cyprus. I suppose the one downside, you'll see they're both wearing, <laughs> they're not spectacular clothes, are they? They're, they're obviously they're, uh, the clothes that they were given to, to travel in. Um, but that was it, they got married, and he never called her Gwen, he always called her my dove. And uh, they were married, obviously, until the day that, ta uh, that Tommy died. Gwen was a great support and got him going. She was really supportive of his act. And once they got, uh, he got, oh, uh, Tommy got discharged, in about 1945, 46, I think it was 46 he got discharged. Um, she started as his agent trying to get him. Tommy was actually a traveling salesman, but in the evenings then he tr would try and get some, uh, uh, some work in clubs or cabarets or nightclubs. But the big change was when this guy, Miff Ferry, um, decided to uh, take him on board. Miff Ferry was an agent. He was a, actually a trombone player, but he did a bit of part-time work as an agent. And he signed up both Tommy and Bruce Forsyth. Bruce Forsyth, after four years, decided he didn't want to stay with him. And the reason was, Tom, it was Miff was a very canny Scotsman. Normally, you paid 10% to your agent. Miff had done a contract, and he put 15% in it. Bruce decided to get out of it, bought himself out. Tommy stayed with him for the rest of his life. And if you look at the correspondence between the two, it is like a rowing 
well, brother and sister, because they, they row about everything, and Tommy would try and hide any money he earned so that he didn't have to pay the 15% to Miff. But Miff was a very good influence on him and did look after him. Um, there was, there's, there's a great, there's a great um, uh, time when in 1954, Tommy was actually appearing in Las Vegas, and he managed to wangle an extra couple of weeks, which Miff didn't know about, because in those days he went over by, by, uh, by steamer, and you, know, you, you, didn't, you didn't fly there. So he, he didn't know, and he couldn't keep in touch with anybody by telephone. So he didn't know anything about that, but he suspected that Tommy was taking some money that he didn't know about. So he gets, a, <laughs> Tommy gets, a, a, he's, a, he's at the Sands in Las Vegas now, you know, doing the, one of the biggest shows you could do in, in the country, and he gets a telegram, opens the telegram, it's from Miff. Return next week for rehearsals. You're playing the king in Humpty Dumpty in Dudley. And, uh, so, so he had to leave Las Vegas behind and return to Dudley to do the, uh, to the, do the pantomime there. And that's what a lot of his work in those, in those days, uh, very early days, he would do his act um, on some of the music hall, but his music hall was dying in the variety shows. And of course, if you went on to television, if you did your act once, people had seen it. Music halls, you could stay and you could do it an awful lot of the time. You could do it because you, you're in a different town every, every time. His first, his first place was the, uh, the windmill. And of course, people didn't go to the windmill to see the comedians. Um, but he spent there uh, 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 about two years. A lot, it was the grounding of a lot of our uh, early comedians. He got 30 pounds a week when he worked there. And that was in 1948. But he did 50 shows a week, 50 shows a week. And he said he learned because there was no audience reaction at all. <laughs> he said because they were just waiting for the next tableau to come on. But that's where he started. He met Max Miller there. Um, Max Miller, very different sort of comedian, uh, but equally as mean. And there's a great story that they met in a pub in Brighton. And it took four hours for either of them to buy the other one a drink. They managed to sponge it off everybody else that had come in. But four hours, it, it was a matter of honour that neither of them would buy each other a drink. At home, this is, this is uh, Vicky when she's small, she said, everywhere you went, our, our house was full of props, things that would jump out, there'd be a dead hand or a spider or something that Dad was working on. And uh, here, <coughs> here, here's Vicky and here's, uh, here's Tommy Jr. Um, she said, I, we always remember Mum would take him into the front room and we'd hear that the kids were in the back room uh, with, with the nanny and in the front room she said Mum would be saying, right, no Tommy, look towards the camera now, turn left. No, no, a little bit longer, and she'd be rehearsing him. And Tommy's whole life, you thought he was a bit of a bumbling fool, but that was all extremely well rehearsed. And the great story I was told was when he went and did the Double Diamond, which is the only place I ever saw him live, the Double Diamond in Caerphilly, he used to stay at Corbett's Country Club. And at Corbett's Country Club, he'd have two rooms, one room for him, one room for all his props. And he had a spare of all the props. You'll remember, he always used to walk through the gate and out of the gate. Well, he had two of those, just in case it went wrong. He had the famous duck that would, uh, would, pick, it, would pick it. And I was going to bring my duck tonight, but he's not feeling very well. So, so he didn't come. <coughs> he'd, he'd seen an orange earlier today, so he wasn't feeling too good. Anyway, as I said, Gwen, Gwen was, was pretty... Um, they, were, they were a great team. Um, there's been a, 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 a programme, I think, on television recently, which sort of showed them in a bad light. And uh, the, the society were not very happy about that. Neither was his daughter, because it showed him as, as being a bit of a wife beater and a, a drunkard. He did enjoy his drink, but he wasn't a wife beater. And a lot of it, but that, you know, not being that, doesn't sell television programs. And I think David Threlfall played him, played him okay, but at the end of the day, the story was not something that we would support at all. Here he is at the 1950, at the opening of, of the studios. He realised, and Miff realised, that television was going to be the way to go. And he became more and more in the, in the 50s. Tommy would do his act with the, with the magic. But once you'd seen that, of course, you could see it again. But he got more into sketches. And the, his great friend, uh, Eric Sykes, would, would do the sketches with him. Now, I've done a bit of work. I'm going to have a drink, little drink now. I'm going to ask you there, can you name one famous footballer and six comedians in that picture? Have I got any? Stanley Matthews. No, not Gordon Banks, no. Stanley Matthews. Well, what's his name? Oh, I know his face. <laughs> the game is a competition, you've got to tell me. <laughs> Charlie Chester. Okay, and that's not Jimmy Clitheroe before we start. Okay, and that's not Peter Sellers. Eric and Ernie. Eric and Ernie, you've got there. And these two? Jewel and Warwick. 
Very good. There we go. Okay. okay. Now, I, I do have a prize a little bit later on because you've got a little bit of work to do now. Okay, that's a simple one for you. This is going to be even easier. Max. Correct. That's right. Tommy's favourite comedian was Arthur Askey. And in fact, I, I, I always remember that my, my, my grandfather bought his first radiogram. He bought one record, which was, oh, what a glorious thing to be. A grown-up, grown-up, busy, busy bee. Well, after 15 times, you do get a bit bored with it. So I still remember the words, which is quite frightening. So there we are. So those, those are those three. Uh, and then he, he, at, that, at that time as well, he, he went into sort of review. And this is a great review. Can you imagine now? I can, I, I can imagine this. I go, Benny Hill and Tommy Cooper are in a show with 30 Folie Bergere girls. And that's it. <laughs> it must have been murder. <laughs> it must have been murder every night, twice a night. And it was going to go for three months. It actually ran for 18 months. And uh, I was telling, I showed, the, I put this slide up one day, and there was a chap said at the end of the thing, he said, I saw that show. He said, we, I was with the Scouts from Lanishan. And he said, <laughs> we, we, we went to the New Forest, and we went up to London for the day, and we went to Leicester Square, and Skip went in and bought, you know, you could buy all the cheap tickets, didn't he? He said, I got this show, lads. It's called The Folly Bergere. It's called Paris by Night. He said, it'll be good for your geography. Anyway, he said, <laughs> We were in the front row. He said, I learned more about biology. And Skip was going, for God's sake, don't tell your mums and dads. So, <laughs> but, but it's strange, isn't it? As I said, you learn something every time I, I do the presentation. Um, and at that time as well, he was starting to do a lot of his, his famous acts, the routine where he, he does the, the uh, he becomes about 20 different people with the poem that he does with that. There's the famous bottle trick, which I think I, should, I put on a little bit before you came in. There's the act when he's, uh, he's, he's too, and, and he's gone away from doing the magic now. Um, he's doing, so, say, some of these were written, or the scripts were written by Eric Sykes. And that's, a, I don't know what it was for, but it just, it summed up to me, Tommy Cooper, and it's got that wonderful face that says, well, why shouldn't I have a peg on my head? And there is no reason why you should not have your peg, a peg on. I can't, I can't understand, well, I can't find out why it was put in there, but it's just one of my favorite photographs of Tommy. Okay, a bit more work for you then. <sighs> There, somebody said to me, was that his brother? It was, yeah, it was, no, it wasn't his brother. No. So you got Henry Cooper. You got Eric Sykes, yeah. Who's that? Vera Lynn, yeah. Dickie. Dickie Henderson. Dickie Henderson, yeah. Ray Allen. And another magician. Used to be on What's My Line. David Nixon, well done, very good. Well, I'm, I'm, you're building up now to the big one, okay? So, but I'm, I'm giving you a few prompts, but there we are. I, I see Sue's come to the front because she thinks this is a present. It's a fantastic prize. <laughs> and they say at that time he, he, he did appear in, in many uh, pantomimes, and uh, then he'd be in the floral hall in Scarborough. Um, he, he always used to like to go away to the seaside for his summer. Eastbourne particularly, because that's where Gwen came from. So that was great, and they had a little flat down there. So he, he loved it if he was down there. But you can see that sort of Joan Savage, there's Reg Varney in there. There's a few you know, names that we'll, we've known uh, and have been in, uh, in British variety for a long time. Here he is. Uh, he, he did six Royal Variety shows, and this is the particular one now that I'm going to ask you a question, OK? That's Bernard Delfont. That's the Queen. That's Princess Anne. OK, who's that? Very good. Who's that? Correct. Who's that? Bruce Forsyth. Well, now, come on, he did wait until he was 83. Sir Bruce Forsyth, if you don't mind. Yes. Correct. OK. So the $64,000 question is, who's this gentleman? Pele. Pele. No, it's not Pele. <laughs> what would Pele be doing at the Royal Variety Show? <laughs> Sydney Poitier is not right either. Come on, have a look. Harry Belafonte is not right either. And someone said to me, I did hear Paul Robeson, but I'd say he does look like Paul Robeson, but he's 1971, and Paul Robeson was about 67 at that stage. No? Does anybody know? I'll give you a clue. Nat King Cole, Nat King Cole is not right either. I'll give you a clue then. This gentleman in 1971 sold more records in South Africa than anyone else. He's not South African, he's American. He's called Lovelace Watkins. 
And I didn't know that until somebody, somebody pointed that out to me. And to prove that he's called Lovelace Watkins, there's his picture of <laughs> Lovelace Watkins. But that was, those were the people in the, in the Royal Variety Show. So my prize can stay, the champagne can stay on ice then. But I don't know what Huey Green was doing on there, but Shirl, as our Shirl, she was on there, and Ken Goodwin. And, and I, someone was saying to me, was he the one who said, I <laughs> can't take my coat off, I'm not stopping. No, he wasn't. Like that. <laughs> like, I looked to my, my ex-boss, who knows, he saw them all live. <laughs> in musical. There we are. Uh, okay. Um, so I've got, to, I've got to think what his, what his catchphrase was. No, wrong with it. You, you'll no doubt make up one by the end of the evening. All right. Um, okay. There's a few more for you to get. Anita Harris. Clive Dunn. Pianist. Russ Conway. That's right. That's the clue I give there. He's, he always had, he had a finger missing, didn't he? So, yeah. There we are. At that stage, he went on and he made The Plank. The greatest silent film ever made. But look who's in it. This is what makes me laugh. Graham Stark was in every film known to man. And he always had one line. Like, Best of luck, sir. Or don't let him get you, sir. And, or whatever. But oops, sorry. But you can see, I can't believe it. Stratford Johns, who was in Zed Cars, wasn't he? He was a Jim Dale, Hattie Jakes. Well, she was in everything at the same time. And a very, very young Jimmy Tarbuck at the time. And that looks to me like um, Una, Una Stubbs, doesn't it? But she's not, she's not shown there. And Roy Castle as well. Oops. So yes, that was, that was a famous one. There was a follow-up to it. Tommy did make about seven or eight films, but this was the most famous. And it was written by I say, his, his great mate, uh, Eric. Uh, and here the Coopers were in 1972. Here they are. He, he, he was one of the water rats at the time. And uh, he, he did a lot of work in raising money and was very very keen with the royalty. There is a famous story that um, when he was uh, in the line, which you saw a bit earlier on, that uh, the, the line at the Royal Variety, and one of the things, the protocol, I've never met the Queen, but you are told the Queen speaks to you, you never speak to the Queen. So they came along and uh, the Queen said to Tommy, <laughs> oh, Tommy, your, uh, Mr. Cooper, your, your, uh, your, your comedy this evening was wonderful. My mother and I thought it was very funny. Thank you, Majesty. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, so she moved along to Shirley Bassey. Oh, Miss Bassey, your, your gown is beautiful and you sang really well. Oh, thank, thank you, thank you. And she's just moving on a bit. And Tommy just went, ah, excuse me, Your Majesty. <laughs> and everyone went, oh my God. <laughs> Bernard Delfont, oh, the Queen's equerry. You, you don't do that. She turned back, yes, Mr. Cooper. He said, do you like football? <laughs> she looked like that. She said, well, not really, no. Any chance I can have your tickets for the FA Cup final? <laughs> It's never known whether he did or not, or was sent to the, <laughs> sent to the tower. Here he is in the double diamond, and uh, with, you can see Stan Stennett on this, this side here, presenting uh, a team of lads. I've never found out who those lads are, because a lot of the pictures I've got off the web don't tell you who anything is. I think that's the, uh, one of the owners of the, of, the, of the double diamond was up at the time, and they, I think that was the double diamond challenge cup. But I'd love to meet one of those lads to see what he said. But I, I said, I see, did, has anyone else, did anyone else see Tommy Cooper live? At one of the clubs, yeah. Did, did, you, know, did, did, you saw him at the Double Diamond, and you can imagine, well, you were there. There were a thousand people in the Double Diamond. Tommy Cooper, ladies and gentlemen, Tommy Cooper. And the curtains wouldn't come up, and all you'd hear is, ah, how do we get out? Who's turned the lights out? And for 10 minutes, he wouldn't come on stage. And people, were they not, were rolling on the floor laughing. You'd seen it all, and you saw his entire act before. You could virtually say verbatim what it would be, and I had the funniest two hours of my life. So at midnight, it's great for me, I can have a drink and I can go home. What does Tommy do? Now, it is difficult, isn't it? You don't go home to read your library book with a Horlix after you've got people onto such an adrenaline high. So Tommy did enjoy both a cigar and a drink. And here he is, I'm afraid, indulging in both of them. He did smoke Romeo and Juliet cigars, the very, very big long ones. And at the end of his life, he was smoking eight a day, which is not very good for someone who had pleurisy and was was suffering an awful lot but that's what he enjoyed doing and he did enjoy a drink here he is with his family and these are the two aunties here this auntie here is the one who gave him the magic set so we have a lot to thank this lady for don't we uh, and this lady here is somebody who's helped the society an awful lot uh, betty and she's she's very good she's a cousin of tommy and that's her daughter as well so those there they were after tommy had been in, in uh, um the uh, uh the, the, the double diamond as well. 
Sadly, the, the double diamond is no longer with us. There, there's a great story somebody told me about the Stonely when he was down in Porth Call. Tom, Tommy was staying in the Sea Bank, and when he got back home, he was desperately hungry. So about, about three o'clock in the morning, he starts cooking, on the gas fire in there, he starts cooking beans on toast and set all the fire alarms off. Everybody gets pushed out onto the front of the Esplanade in, uh, in Porth Call. The manager says, we can't have this happening. So he ran the bloke who, who uh, you know, he rang the bloke who, who ran uh, the double, the, not the double, the uh, Stonely, uh, a guy called Bainan, and said to him, look, we can't have Tommy eating. He said, leave it with me, I'll sort it out. So he rang the police station in Bridgend. He said, where can we get somewhere for Tommy Cooper to eat, uh, have a meal? He can't drive anywhere because he'd be drunk. So the, the police officer said, leave it with me. He said, I'll send a squad car up there at half past one and we pick him up. So they took, picked him up. They took him to Caroline Street in Cardiff <laughs> where Tommy had bought the boys a couple of beers and they had a curry and they bring him home. And just before they're leaving, Tommy leaned over a well and <laughs> did the old trick. No, he didn't do it this time. He, he leaned over and he gave the guys, he gave them 20 free tickets. So the entire bank at Bridge End Police Station went to see him and they took it in turns to take Tommy out for something to eat. <laughs> You couldn't do it these days, could you? Well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Right. Um, his health was failing, as I said, and sadly, um, Tommy died in 1984. And um, as I said, it, it's uh, one of those things. It, it has been, um, th th there's a video of it been on YouTube for some years, which the society tried to get off. Who wants to watch somebody actually physically dying on stage? But there's a great story that was told by one of the people who were there that night from one of the f flying pickets uh, who were singing. And they came in and they said, because it was uh, take, th this took place in a theatre, um, they said they had to get, and it was only there for one night, they had to get all the camera angles right. So we came on and we were told our rehearsal was at seven to half past seven. So they'd get all the, all the camera angles right for the director. So they did all that. So they went right through this cast and Tommy Cooper was top of the bill. He said, we were on stage. Like, Carpenters were hammering, the electricians were talking, everybody was having a cup of tea. So nobody was watching us. He said, when Tommy Cooper came on, he said, everybody stopped. The carpenters stopped. They all wanted to see this guy's act. And Tommy came on and he did his act. And right at the end, because as you remember, when he died, he had a big cloak on and he was passing things out from behind the, the curtain. And he's passing like a, a, a stepladder out and things like that. They did all that on stage and t the director said to him, great, got all the angles, Tommy, that's fantastic. And Tommy looked over his shoulder and said, well, I might do it like that, but I might do it something differently. And so when he actually collapsed, nobody really realised straight away that that's what had happened. He'd actually had a heart attack. And it's one of the reasons why the society now <laughs> is trying to get, raise money for defibrillators, because had there been a defibrillator there, Tommy might still be with us. And I wouldn't be having to give the talk, he'd be doing it himself, I'm sure. <laughs> but, but there we are. So that's the story of Tommy Cooper. The legacy he's left us, well, um, he left us with lots and lots of video clips and stuff that's on. I just, I just well, the only thing I'll do here is say, Michael Parkinson says, right at the bottom, Michael Parkinson says, the worst person to interview after that so-and-so emu was, um, and we all remember Michael Parkinson with the emu, was Tommy Cooper. He said, because you, you'd come on, you'd have a script, and Tommy would not go by the script. And he said, he always remember one night he came down the stairs, remember the stairs at Parkinson, came down, and he had a pair of chicken legs. He had a tuxedo on and a pair of chicken legs, and sat down and just crossed his legs and didn't say anything about the chicken legs. And Parkinson corpsed. Parkinson could not carry on. And, and Cooper's face was just, as you saw it a bit, when he had the peg on. Great guy with a deadpan face. Anyway, that's the memories he's left us. Some of the other things that we did, we found, we found a lot of these, these things are around. There was the, uh, the golf game. There's a little corgi vehicle. There's a Meccano set for those boys who remember Meccano. There we are. Um, there was a famous stamp, and uh, Tommy was very pleased about that. His daughter said, really, really was delighted. He said, she, I, I said, why was he so delighted? He said, because my head's bigger than the Queen's. And of course it is. And you will notice I have not coloured in that red nose. That was actually as it was in the stamp. So very, very realistic. Um, oops, it's about time. I thought it would give up. I was saying to uh, the organiser here, I, I, did, <laughs> I left that in the bag. We used to have a very old cat who died, sadly, about two years ago, 25 years old. And before it left, though, it got very incontinent and it weed on my bag. 
and it's weed on that, and that has never worked properly since. It's, it's the legacy of Lucy. Uh, so you have to apologise, I'll bend over. There's, there's one of our members found that at Machu Picchu. This is probably 4,000 years old, and probably <laughs> there was somebody called Thomas Cooper in those years ago. There's a Banksy somewhere. That'll make somebody some... Oh, that that was on the end of the library, hey? You would... So get Banksy over and see if he'll do one. Uh, someone, and <laughs> someone challenged me. Someone's had that tattooed on his knee. And I, can, I won't borrow my trousers up and show you, but it is not me. Someone in Lincolnshire has had that done. Uh, there's the famous... You can just see the, eff, the effigy there of a, on the bottom of a Peter's pie in Caerphilly. <laughs> Oh, it's a bit spooky now, isn't it? <laughs> and uh, all the stuff that was around there, for example, the fezes, the real fezes, were, were, or a, a Tommy Cooper fez with authenticity, will go for that sort of money in 2010. The two, two or three weeks after Tommy uh, had been cremated and his ashes were scattered in their home in Chiswick, Tommy's son came over and brought the fez that he was wearing when he collapsed and gave it to Eric Sykes. And Eric kept it on the top of his mantelpiece until, sadly, Eric died a couple of years ago. But that's how good friends they were. Here are some people with their fezzes. There's, uh, I, I do apologise for being in the way. I shall bend down. Getting it's getting up again is my problem. Uh, so there's, there's our Henry. <laughs> there's, uh, yeah, just like that. You may not have recognised him with his clothes on, but he, d he does occasionally wear them. There's uh, Capello, <laughs> the old... Uh, there's Ozzy Cooper. Russ Abbott, who is an extremely good supporter uh, and a good impressionist of Tommy Cooper. Homer Cooper. Obama Cooper. <laughs> God forbid we have Trump. Cooper Trump. Oh, I, that man just worries me. I don't know about it. Um, and there's one of those cigars that Tommy was smoking there. Eight a day of, I'm afraid, towards the end. Marco Pierre White on the left. There's the man who got us into the mess. What mess? <laughs> just like that, I'll get you out of the mess. And then there's my, my famous friend, Joe Stalin. Sick of Hamel, Hammersickle, just like that. <laughs> and of course then, there were, as I said, we, we've identified the, 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 the fezzes for animals. <laughs> so for those of you who like rabbits, we've got rabbits, we've got pigeons, <laughs> little cats, we've got dogs, we've got little dogs, and big dogs, hamsters, <laughs> camels, crustacea, I'm not quite sure what that is. We'd have to look in a reference book. So if you could <coughs> nip out and get them for me. And the famous bouncing elephants, which my grandchildren found for me and think are the best of all. Um, so that, that's really the legacy with Tommy. Ooh, I should try and stand up. Um, and you all know he was born in 1921. Uh, and in 2003, uh, a group of people met together to try and say, well, how can we celebrate Tommy? Because Tommy was a sort of comedian you could take your granddaughter and your grandmum to, to see. Because he never used any bad language, never felt recourse for doing that. And as somebody told me, I, I have sworn in giving this presentation a couple of times, and they said Tommy wouldn't have done that. I've been told quite rightly that wouldn't be the case. So this is the grand group of people. Uh, I wonder if that's still working. Nope, nothing's working at all, so I'll have to point to them. Jude Jones, who's the current chairman, and sits, sits amongst us here with his good lady wife, who's a life member of the society. Uh, and Betty, who I've uh, had Tony about before, who was his, his niece. This gentleman here is Mr. Shattuck, and that was the, that's the, grand, oh, that's the son of the lady who brought Tommy into, into the world, if you remember I talked about Mr. Shattuck there. That's Gren, who very much sadly missed now, and I think that's Gren's son. Uh, and Gren, uh, at the very beginning, gave us quite a lot of cartoons of Tommy, which we were able to, to raise money. And this chap here is Angus Donaldson, and together Angus and Tudor decided it would be a great thing if we could have a statue to commemorate Tommy in his home town. And of course people say, well, why not? Why? You, you, didn't, you, know, you only lived there for three years. Yes, that's right. You, know, you live in lots of places, but you're only born in one place. And that's why we de deliberately went along the lines of saying we'd like to have a statue. So work started. Uh, a moquette, I think I believe is called there. That's, that's with Jim Dunn, who is actually the sculptor that was chosen at the end to carry out the work. And uh, to raise the money, we had to raise something like £56,000. Um, had to be raised. Uh, I think for the, the statue was about 46000 and there was a, some, some sub 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 subsidiary work of moving trees and stuff like that. So we've, we've got uh, these uh, pavers that were done. 
uh, which are alongside it. We had this wonderful competition. Uh, a, a team challenged us from Hampshire, who, uh, and they used to play in, um, in fezzes. They challenged us. That gentleman here is their local plumber, who does not only Tommy Cooper impressions, but does Elvis Presley, and it was brilliant. I tell you, if you ever, had him, if you ever want a plumber that would keep you entertained, this, this guy was brilliant. <laughs> and in fact, he looks like Elvis Presley would now, uh, if Elvis Presley was still alive, as you can see. Yeah. Firmly rounded, but he was, they were great fun. We turned up, uh, our lot hadn't played cricket. We used to play cricket on a Tuesday, Wednesday evening in, in the parks over here. That lot, there was an electronic scoreboard. But we had 3,000 people there. And in the end, we, we had a collection and we made about 250 quid, which is fantastic. Uh, but it was all things like that. It all went to build up the, su the sum. We had uh, all sorts of raffles. We had uh, fun runs. We had a couple of golf days. There was, this was the golf day in Caerphilly. And if you won on the last hole, there were any golfers. On the last hole, had you got a hole in one, you won a Mini Cooper. Didn't I just want somebody to get a hole in one? Not because of anything else, but what fantastic publicity. Sadly, nobody won it, but there we are. We, we, we raised money and had fun. And that's part of the ethos of the Tommy Cooper Society, is to raise money by having some fun. Here's Stan Stennett. This is the big cheese that regularly takes place in July every year in Caerphilly. Uh, and this is the comedy tent. Uh, we also have a birthday celebration that's coming up, I think, on March the 19th up in Ustradmark. And here we celebrate Tommy's birthday. It'll be his 94th, I think, 94th. 95th, 95th birthday, thank you, Jude. Uh, and here's, here again is Vicky and, and Betty and dear Angus, and Tommy's actually joined us for that one as well. And it's great because all the students get to, get to, to know about Tommy and, uh, and they, they will dress up with fezzes and give us some jokes. Here's Brian Hibbard from the Flying Pickets who told us that story. Sadly, he passed away. When I started this presentation about seven years ago, most of these people were still alive. So, uh, <laughs> but poor old Brian's passed away as well. Um, we had this gentleman uh, came along and brought the Magic Circle down to Caerphilly. He was Tommy's bank manager and also happened to be secretary of the Magic Circle. Now, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't fancy a magician being my bank manager. But there we are. Um, and this is where we finally got the, the, slot, the, the spot. Here's the uh, Tudor and Angus and their wives seeing the, 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 uh, the clay model. And that was taken down then to Narbuth, where it, it was... Uh, metalled and turned into metal and here's the great day where our patron Sir Anthony Hopkins turned up uh, to uh, unleash the beast as it were and there's Tommy and to be fair to Sir Anthony he then did 10 minutes to 15 minutes of Tommy Cooper jokes probably the better far better impression than I could ever have done he did extremely well so here's the facts of the statue as well as two of the oldest things in Caerphilly that's not me and him but it's <laughs> It's Tommy and, uh, and the, the, the castle. Uh, it's in a fantastic position, and you do see an awful lot of people go there and actually take a photograph of him. So uh, they, he will, uh, as I said, it's 45,000 for the statue. It's uh, got this little rabbit on the front, which is where you tend to find a lot of people taking the photographs. Um, there aren't many things now remembering Tommy. This was outside the Shepperton Studios where they took a lot of photographs. Uh, I was... I, Sorry? They've got, the right date. They've got the right date there. However, Shepparton's been knocked down. Before it was knocked down, somebody stole the plaque. So that doesn't exist any longer. So that's why we're so proud of our statue down here, which does commemorate him. There's this on one of the, this is on, in Eastbourne. This is the flat that he and Gwen used to retire to. And somebody's put that on the outside, which is just a nice little rem memory of Tommy or a magician with a fez and some of the, uh, some doves escaping. Uh, we, we carry on various events. As I said, we, w once we raised the money for the statue, which was a big, the big effort, we turned our attention to what we could then do, and we realised the, the shortage of uh, defibrillators that were around. So that's what we've raised up with funds for, and I think we're up to we're, we're approaching our tenth defibrillator. They're about a thousand pounds. So when I give the talks, um, I, and then not for not for today. I have to I have, hasten to add, <laughs> this is my gift to Runa Penna Library because I want to see you survive. We did it with Rag and the Reservoir Action Group, which I was familiar with, so I'm just, I'd be delighted to keep coming down here and supporting the library. But from our point of view, um, you know, any, any money that we get, we, we put towards the defibrillators. There was a chap here, and, and have you seen him, this chap? Do you know what this is, by the way? This is, oh, it's a picture of Tommy Cooper. It's toast. And I watched, I watched this young lad do this on the floor. It took him two hours, and he used pot of Marmite, as he said, my mum's knife, 
because he comes from Ebervale, with my mum's knife and some tomato ketchup. <laughs> and that was it. And we thought, that's brilliant. So we put it between two pieces of glass and we pulled all the air out and we thought, that'll last forever. The last time I saw it, it's got green mould growing all over there, which is such a shame. But oh, it's, it's brilliant. This, this lad is such a... Nathan, his name is. He's such a great guy. But it's, it's sort of events like that that we, 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 uh, we enjoy sort of supporting. Particularly, though, with the British Art Foundation, they wanted to use Tommy because Tommy had died of a heart attack. Uh, and so that's what they did. I'll leave you with this picture here, which is Angus, poor old Angus, uh, left us last, last year and sadly passed away. But... That was a great day because this lad, young lad, Fletcher, came down. And Fletcher is about 12, I suppose, in those days. And he did a five-minute impression of Tommy Cooper. And what we like to do is hand on. I, I, there are not a lot of youngsters here today. There's one here who's going to help me with my trick in a minute. Oh, she's good. She's woken up now. <laughs> and she's beginning to panic. Um, but no, she, uh, I, from that point of view, um, it, it's, it's all about the legacy we're handing her on. I showed you, I think, a bit earlier on, uh, a DVD that had been done, and this had been done by Bedworth Junior School, and their project was to, to, to learn about Tommy Cooper. And of course they'd all say, oh, my granddad told me about him, or my dad told me about him. But they learnt about him, and it was great for me to go in and talk to some very young kids to do it, and produce this uh, wonderful cartoon that they did. Ladies and gentlemen, that's about all I've got to say. Um, I'm happy to talk about some questions, but I'll just then, if I just might finish with a little, little trick, okay? And as you can see, Help me. What's your, what's your name? Fion. Fion. Okay, you're coming here. Are you married? No, you are. Okay, fine. I am. Okay, so now Fion, can you tell me, is there anything in that bag? No. I'm going to have a look. Go and have a look. Is there anything in the bag? Nothing at all in the bag. Okay, so you're going to hold that bag for me, all right? And I now will see. I've got, I've got to be very careful because I've got to find out. I think I've, put, I've left my. Magic wand in here. Oops. Oh. I've got to find my magic wand. I didn't bring my magic wand tonight, Fionn, so you're going to have to hold that with the other hand. OK. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to look and see if I can find some light. So if you just hold it out right in front of you, OK, and I'll see if I can come over. Oh! Okay. <laughs> <I don't... laughs> and catch some, some lights in there. Thank you very much. Right, Fionn, if you'd like to now say the magic words, which are Izzy Wizzy, let's get busy. Okay? Izzy Wizzy, let's get busy. And then you tap the magic wand on there. Right, okay? And then what I've got to do now is go. And your job, Fionn, is to pick all of those up while I answer the questions. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Right, sorry, there we are. Any questions? <laughs> That's the only one that ever goes right. Sorry, there we are, I'm back on. My lifeline is, is back in. Any questions I can ask you? Sir? He was, he, he was indeed. He, he was an exceptionally good magician, and one trick out of ten showed that that was the case. Mm. And, and yes, he, he was. In fact, if you, if you, you can go, you can get a trip. If you go to London, you can get a trip round the, uh, the Magic Circles Museum, and there's a whole section with Tommy Cooper's props in there. A lot of them were left in there. But he was an extremely good magician. But he realised there are a lot of extremely good magicians. But there was only one guy that actually goofed on <laughs> nine tricks out of ten. And, and you never knew which trick he was going to make. <laughs> Fionn, you've got one right in the middle of your <laughs> You can keep that one. <laughs> Anything else I can help you with before you go and have a cup of coffee? No? Sorry? Who's the chap on the right? This gentleman here. Well, it, it's a bad, bad news because he, he's, been put, he's just come out of prison. And, uh, <laughs> no, he's sitting out there. He's, he's the current chairman of the Tommy Cooper Society. His name is Tudor Jones. I don't got the handcuffs. And he's, he's, <laughs> he's, 
he's got to, yeah, he's got to be in by nine o'clock. <laughs> he's, he's under curfew. <laughs> yeah, but <clears throat> but his wife's with him. His wife's with him. Right? His wife's with him. <laughs> no, Tudor. Ju 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 um, you may have you've seen his name on that. He used to be a scriptwriter for the two Ronnies, and. Uh, for most of my reports when I worked for him in British Gas, <laughs> he, he, he used to be, but he, he's a genuinely very funny gentleman and is a, a great guy who's, who's in charge of the, he's just a chairman of the, uh, the Tommy Cooper Society at the moment. <coughs> okay, so I'm in your hands now. Oh, oh sorry. Excellent. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'll just make you disappear, shall I? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> just like that. Just like that. How, how often have we said that today? <laughs> thank you. In fact, Phil was going to say thank right. you and good night, but I would just like to say um, all our speakers don't charge anything for these um, talks. They do it because of the, the fight to save the library. So we have already got some money donated to cover all of our costs. So if anybody would like to donate anything to the cause, we can get a little pot and we can hand it over afterwards because it seems only fair that you've come out and done so well so thank you and I was talking to somebody called Steve Trent who's really called Graham and he comes in the library but his stage name was Steve Trent he was a singer and he was um, on first of all and his um, sort of signature tune was Danny Boy in a little mishmash and turned into something else quite a sort of tearjerker and Tommy Cooper was going on afterwards and somebody came over and said Tommy doesn't want you to sing that and he said, well, it's my signature tune. And he said, well, he, he doesn't want you to sing it, so would you cut it out? And he said, well, yeah, he's top bill, so that's fine. And Tommy came over afterwards and said to him, really sorry about that, but I've got to go on after you. And you do a tearjerker like that, and I've got to raise him up, but I'll buy you a pint afterwards. So he did spend money on that. <laughs> but I'd like to thank you all for coming. You've all got on your seats what we've got coming on next. We have the... Why I said no to Dr. No, or life as an air stewardess, depends on if you're a Bond fan or you want to know about life in the skies in the BOAC um, many moons ago when it was very glamorous and the jet set and not just all of us, cattle class. Um, we've also got Bernard Knight coming back because it seems oh, he's, yeah. uh, it's, there's an insatiable need. We've already oversubscribed on him again. Um, but I'll hand you over to Phil. Thank you so much for coming. We do have tea and coffee and more refreshments. If you want to talk to this fine gentleman, Chris will stay around for a little while and Tudor's here as well. So you might as well make good use of them, haven't you? So thank you very much again. Thank Thanks, you, Chris. Thank, 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 thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.